Hi everyone, uh, good morning. Welcome to the uh, summit. Make sure you put our headphones on. I think I need the headphones on for you to hear me. I'll give everyone a minute to put your headphones on. Yeah, uh, hi, so my name is Jay. I'm uh, one of the co-founders of a company that we're building a product called Daft. And today I'll be talking to you about how to build a multimodal data lake house. And so, you know, we all know that we all know and love our data lake houses. Uh, but what happens if you have a bunch of PDFs, right, or a bunch of images, or, you know, audio files? How do you manage that in your data lake house? I'm going to show that to you today. Um, so just a little bit about me. I'm a co-founder at a company called Eventual. Uh, prior to Eventual, I was a software lead in biotech at a company called Freenome and Lyft uh, Level 5, where we were building autonomous vehicles. So I've been building distributed data systems for machine learning and multimodal type data for a while now. Uh, and yeah, now I'm a maintainer of Daft, which is a distributed query engine in Python. And we'll see some demos later on where I use Daft. Um, but first, yeah, so what is the goal for today's talk, right? Today, I'm trying to convince you today that your data lake can actually also handle multimodal data. It can handle all your PDFs and your images and your audio files. Uh, but, right, watch out for the many foot guns, right? It's, uh, there are many, many small things you have to be aware of when you try to use your data lake and your existing setup for, for this multimodal type data. So first, let's go through what the data lake house looks like, right? So generally speaking, there's two layers to a data lake house. You have the data lake at the bottom. That's your storage layer, right? You have, you know, technologies like AWS S3, Parquet. That's your pure kind of file system storage. And then you layer on top of that something like Delta Lake or Iceberg, which organizes those Parquet files, right? That's your storage. And the beauty of it is that Delta Lake and Iceberg are both open source, and so plenty of uh, engines can read it. And so now we can look at the data engines that can all read your data lake. These are things like Daft, Spark, Trino. Uh, and yeah, this works really, really well, especially if you have just, you know, tabular data. But what happens when you add multimodal data into the mix? All of a sudden, two things need to happen. Your data engine needs to be able to support multimodal operations, right? So instead of just like adding numbers together or getting the mean of, 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 a, of a data frame or, you know, um, doing string, string truncations. Now you might want to do, hey, tell me how many pages this PDF has, right? Um, and, and so the data engine now has to support both multimodal data and also your regular tabular data. On the data, data lake portion of it, your data lake now needs to be able to store and retrieve both multimodal and tabular data at the same time. And so you might want to do something like that, where you might want to you know, write parquet. Uh, and you want, might want to write your images into Parquet. How do you even do that, right? Those are all big question marks in your head right now. Uh, and so, yeah, there's a whole bunch of challenges when you're working with multimodal data um, in, in your data lake. Uh, first of all, you know, we see this very often in the wild. You're storing multimodal data as URLs in your table, right? All of a sudden, you have a million URLs, image1, image2.jpg, and now you have a million URLs. And just working with all those URLs is uh, super painful because even listing those URLs is also really painful um, and slow. And so, yeah, this gets unwieldy really, really quickly. Uh, second of all, uh, lot, all your data is usually stored in these opaque formats and encodings. So if you have PDFs, for example, like what data engine can understand PDFs natively right now? Nothing really. Uh, you have to build your own custom software or use your own custom libraries in order to do it. Um, and so if you wanted to run a simple query like that where, you know, say, hey, filter my data set for PDFs with three pages, you can't really express that without bringing in a whole bunch of custom software, right? Uh, the third thing, which I think is really, really interesting, is that in multimodal data, the compute you want to run per row is a lot heavier, right? You're no longer just doing additions of numbers or you know, subtractions of numbers. Now, all of a sudden, you're running things like run an LLM on a GPU, right? That's the first example here. Run an LLM on my images, uh, run it on the GPU. Or you're running things like, you want an LLM on my images, I want to make a remote call to OpenAI. you will see that in the demo later too. Um, and that's you kind of offloading the heavy compute to some other platform so that they can run it for you. Both of these have their associated challenges. The first one, it's really difficult. If anyone's tried to use Spark with GPUs, I don't know, raise your hand if you've tried to do that. It's horrendous, horrible. Um, and the second one, you know, if you're making these remote calls, has anyone and try to like make remote calls to OpenAI through Spark. Okay, it's also horrible because you get all these rate limiting and you know like throttling and it's so painful, right? Uh, so that's really really difficult in multimodal. And uh, number four, uh, the big the big oom, right? Uh, if if the problem with multimodal data is that you're constantly inflating your data, 
if you go from URLs, you download the data, that's an order of magnitude of inflation, right? And then you, you decode that data, that's another order of magnitude of inflation. And that's why our systems often go boom and oom um, when, when you try to, to work with multimodal data. So yeah, I'm gonna jump straight into the demo uh, and show you it's kind of like, it is possible to work with multimodal data today, but, and get around all those challenges we talked about earlier, but you do have to be very aware of some of these uh, foot guns and work around them or use software like Daft, where we are building in a lot of these uh, 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 things to encourage best practices. So let's go through an example today of, you know, let's say you have just a bunch of images in S3, right? This is what it looks like. You have all these images, they're all, you know, JPEG files, and you have a whole bunch of them. You have like, you know, thousands of them. In this case, I think I have like 40,000 images in this S3 bucket. And we wanna go from this, right? This isn't super useful for anyone coming to the project for the first time. You have to build your own software to read it and understand it but well, we wanna to go to something more like this, where you have you know, kind of a table with image thumbnails, right? You can see the thumbnails on the side. Uh, it has a nice description, right? That gives you something to kind of search over, like give me all images in this case uh, with dogs in them. And then you know there's a path to the raw file and also size, right? So you could maybe filter, uh, filter out all images that are too large or too small. Uh, these are just size and bytes. So yeah, going from this to this will increase that usability of your data lake uh, for your multimodal data exponentially, because now all of a sudden you have all these useful fields of metadata to start querying your data on. So let's start with the demo. Um, first, I'm gonna import Daft. Uh, Daft makes it really easy to access S3, um, which we are gonna be doing today. I hope the internet is good here. Um, and first, we're gonna use Daft to list this bucket. And so this is a completely public bucket. You can do this at home too. Uh, highly encourage you to do it at home. Um, and it's gonna list this bucket and give us a data frame now of, uh, yeah, just, you know, these uh, URLs. And so you have a whole bunch of URLs, including the size of the images. Now, how do we go from URLs to our multimodal data, right? Daft makes it really easy to work with URLs because with multimodal data, URLs are like everywhere. It's really, really good to use URLs because they're so lightweight, right? If you're trying to sort your your data set, you don't want to be sorting your data set with images flying around in your, in your sort. You want to be sorting it with URLs. Um, and with Daft, all you got to do to download data from URLs is you tell it, you know, create a new column called image bytes and run the URL download expression. Uh, and actually, even though this is a Python API, Daft runs everything under the hood in async Rust, makes it really, really quick. And for the user, you, all you get to see is, you know, you've gone from URLs down to bytes. It's just a bunch of bytes now. Unfortunately, again, when you work with multimodal data, these file formats are often very, very opaque. And so yeah, to use just a bunch of bytes, but these, this is a JPEG, I assure you. And I'm gonna show that to you in a second, right? How do we go from bytes to images? And so um, with Daft, it's also really easy. Um, that's why I'm using it for this demo. Uh, we have native types for images. And so if you just do uh, create a new column called image, decode that image bytes column using image decode. Now, all of a sudden, you know, bam, you have a column full of images, right? Super simple. We've gone from URLs down to images in like four lines of code, give or take. Um, and, and that makes it really easy because you're no longer struggling to write all this IO code and optimizing your, your pipeline all by yourself uh, with, a, with a product like uh, uh, Daft. Now, we're gonna go ahead and do the thumbnail creation really quickly. Again, just running a simple Daft expression. We have a image resize, so we're gonna make it a tiny, tiny image, 32 by 32, right? And so now we have this uh, little image right here uh, where you have all of a sudden this thumbnail that you can use uh, and store in your data lake because these are very, very lightweight and actually uh, possible to store inside of a format like Parquet. All right, now for the fun part. We're gonna run some uh, multimodal LLMs. I'm using GPT-40 today. Uh, with, with OpenAI because I'm running everything on my laptop. I, can't, I don't have a GPU to run an LLM on it. Uh, but yeah, I've defined some functions and I'm just gonna run them right now. First thing we're gonna do is we are going to generate a temporary URL, right? So that we can send this URL over to OpenAI and OpenAI can run their LLM. And we're gonna create a new column called image URLs. Uh, next thing we're gonna do is we're going to uh, run GPT-40. We're just gonna send this URLs over to OpenAI and ask it, you know, hey, what's in this image, right? And it's gonna give us a response. And the third thing we're gonna do is we're gonna use some Daft uh, parsing logic on JSONs to just parse the response that OpenAI sends back to us, right? So that, that's come back in. Um, we can see that, you know, we've gone from images now 
we kind of send this URL over to uh, OpenAI using a temporary URL. We've generated a temporary URL, and that's over here. This temporary URL has a time to live, right? It doesn't live forever, so OpenAI has limited access to our data. And then these are the results that OpenAI sent back to us in JSON form. Kind of hard to read, but we've kind of we've parsed it with this query, and now it's in this little format. The image shows, uh, you know, apron area of an airport. Um, the image uh, depicts a collection of ornate something something, right? Um, so that's that's really cool. We've kind of gone from just like opaque files in a bucket down to something that we can actually start querying now and asking questions about. And so let's go ahead and save that into Delta Lake. Um, so I'm going to select just a bunch of the, the columns. Uh, some best practices, you know, larger multimodal data such as images, you usually want to store them as URLs, right? So we're selecting just the path column here and kind of getting rid of this image column that we've materialized. Just throw it away. We can always grab it again if you want from the URL. Um, smaller multimodal data, such as our thumbnails, right? Like th this column right here, this thumbnail column, just store it in, a, in your data lake, no problem. This, these are really, really small pieces of information. Your data lake can ha handle them just fine. So we're encoding them as JPEG and storing it in, in the data lake as a binary column. And then the, um, oh, whoops, let's see what's going on here. Ah, I think I ran it twice, that's why. But um, yeah, and, and then the last thing is you want to store all of your you know, uh, size and, and all your metadata, the size and the description, et cetera. And so if we look at the data frame, it kind of looks like this now. This is what we're going to be saving into Delta Lake, right? Uh, the path, the image, thumbnail, the size and description. I'm going to run this. It's going to run for a little bit, save it into a Delta Lake table called mytable.deltalake. Um, that's going to be just be a local table for now. It's going to dump a file in here at some point. Give it a, give it a little bit of time to run. Um, yeah, but, but the main idea is that you want to store just lightweight data in your, in your data lake. Again, reiterate, lightweight data in your data lake, such as your image thumbnails. And then you want to store the URLs out to any heavyweight stuff, right? So that your engine, such as Daft or Spark, can then reach out to that URL when it needs to. And if it needs to do any operations like a sort, a join, your images aren't like flying around in your system and taking a whole bunch of memory and causing, potentially causing a whole bunch of problems. Um, so yeah, this is going to take a little bit of time to run because we're now hitting OpenAI and I think the internet's a little bit slow now. Okay, so we've written our table. It's right here, some data in it. Let's uh, load it back in. So now, now you're on the other end, right? You're trying to read the data from your uh, uh, Delta Lake table. What does that look like? So if you're reading a Delta Lake table from Daft, this is kind of what it looks like. It's going to tell you, hey, your Delta Lake table has you know, four columns, path, image, terminal, size, and description, right? And uh, let's say I'm interested in, you know, hey, please filter out uh, uh, all your columns and only give me rows where the description contains the word dog, right? And also, you know, help, please help me visualize my data frame by uh, materializing this image thumbnail as an image. And voila, you have, uh, you know, this very usable kind of uh, 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 data lake now that people can run queries over really, really efficiently. And if you then need to do things like machine learning training, right, you can continue to materialize the, these uh, URLs uh, and then pipe that into training. Or if you want to do batch inference, you can do that as well. Or if you want to run LLMs, do the same thing that we did before, generate a temporary URL, send that over to your favorite LLM provider, um, all super, super lightweight. Uh, and this makes it extremely easy then to work with multimodal data uh, uh, in, in your existing data lake uh, formats. So I'm going to go back to the presentation and do a little bit of recap. Um, oh, why is it telling me to sign in on Google? Sure, I'll sign in. OK. <laughs> What? It's okay. We'll just stick to these slides, I think. So yeah, some best practices. Again, use URLs or data. If something is too large, use URLs, right? Daft will deal with a small problem, small file problem for you because we do a really, really good job at you know saturating the machine's network when we download data from uh, uh, URLs. Um, avoid materialization of your URLs if possible, right? We saw earlier that we were able to use pre-signed URLs, temporary URLs. Uh, or you can also use things like short-lived uh, tokens for remote service calls out to you know, something like uh, OpenAI. Uh, and number three, don't forget your veggies. Don't forget your metadata, right? Your metadata makes your data lake useful. The whole reason you want to store uh, multimodal data in your, um, uh, your, your data lake is to make it useful 
And what you can do is you can extract metadata, right? Get the height out, get the width out, uh, you know, generate some descriptions about it, ask OpenAI some questions so that you can index it. Um, yeah, oh, whoops. Oh God, oh God, give me one second, sorry. Things always go wrong with live demos. Okay, beautiful. And now I think this should work. Okay, yeah, and then number, th number four, please be very, very careful with Parquet. Parquet was not built for uh, multimodal data. So if, uh, the, the best thing you can do for yourself is just keep your blobs that you're storing in your data lake very, very small, uh, or store them as a URL. And then when you do store them, just double check your Parquet metadata and row group sizes. Make sure they're reasonable, otherwise your query times become insane. Uh, or there's a bunch of other file formats out there that you might want to consider, such as LANs and so on and so forth. Um, yeah, uh, kind of a wish list and roadmap, things that we're working on in Daft. We're trying to bake in a whole bunch of best practices, like you know the pre-signed URL stuff. We'll try to bake that in. Um, I think number two is really cool. Uh, we're trying to break in also this idea of global control for how heavily do you want to hit something like OpenAI, right? Please run GPT-40, but you know, limit your tokens per second in total for the entire job to a certain amount. Uh, that helps you keep your error rates and stuff under control. And uh, lastly, I'm pretty excited about this one. Uh, you know, if the data lakes could start supporting indexing of multimodal data, right? For example, if it's stored like embeddings and stuff in, in your data lake, we could potentially do something like give me uh, data frame rows where the image is like a brown car, right? That could be really, really interesting. Um, and we would do a lot of the matching on just like vector indices. Um, but yeah, that's kind of, a, kind of on the roadmap and we're actively talking to folks on the Delta Lake team to see if this is possible. Uh, and that's a wrap. Uh, you can learn more about Daft at you know, getdaft.io. That's our website. We're also hiring. Come talk to us if you're interested in kind of the intersection of ML, AI, distributed computing, databases, multimodal data. Uh, there's my email down below. It's just j at eventualcomputing.com. Feel free to shoot me an email. Um, and that's it. We have some time for questions, so happy to take any questions, or I will be hanging out, I think, just on the side later on if anyone wants to come grab me for a couple of minutes. Um, yeah, that's it for the lightning talk. Thanks for coming in early in the morning. <laughs>